Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight. We are working our way through Leviticus, Exodus, and Deuteronomy, and tonight we hope to be covering Leviticus chapters 11 through 15. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Leviticus chapter 11. That's where we'll start tonight in just a few moments. As always, we want to say that if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a church, Church, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are continuing in our fairly new study of the book of Leviticus. And of course, a major theme in this book is holiness. Holiness being defined as being separate or different from the world around us. And as we've learned, various forms of the word holy are found roughly 89 times in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. And also, we've learned that Leviticus is basically a handbook or a manual for the priest, for those who were responsible for helping the people maintain this holiness or this spiritual cleanliness before the Lord. Well, two weeks ago, we started with an overview of the five major kinds of sacrifices under the law of Moses. Uh, the first three were voluntary acts of worship. The second or the last two, rather, were mandatory. If you sinned under the old law, you had to offer one of these sacrifices sacrifices depending on the circumstances. In terms of a few highlights, we noted that each sacrifice had to be perfect. We also learned that God made allowances for the poor, which we were impressed by that. If you couldn't afford a bull, God allowed a lesser sacrifice like a goat or a bird or even a cup of flour, but those sacrifices had to be perfect. Over time, of course, the people drifted. They started offering uh, animals that were sick or injured, and so this process was abused through the years. God had to step in with warnings from various prophets. Uh, there were also times when people tried to use sacrifices to cover up their own disobedience. And that's not the way it works. We think of King Saul, who was commanded to completely destroy the Amalekites, which he refused to do. And he brought back sacrifices to try to cover up his lack of obedience. And God, of course, was irate at that. And that was really a turning point in Saul's uh, kingship. He really didn't last much longer than that. And another danger came when the people would offer the sacrifices, but their hearts weren't into it. They were simply going through the motions. And obviously that was not acceptable to God either. And uh, I know we don't offer literal sacrifices of bulls and goats and, and sheep and birds and flour and and, and all of that. But there were some principles there that we could learn from in that what we offer to God is to be valuable to us, and we are not to use worship as a covering for evil in our private lives. So a number of things that we learned over the past couple weeks. And then last week we looked at Leviticus chapters 8 through 10, and we saw the consecration of Aaron and his sons. They were installed as priests, as well as the offering of the very first sacrifices in that brand new tabernacle under this new system of worship. And that brought us to the first real abuse of that sacrificial system as we saw Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, offer unauthorized fire before the Lord. So as we learned last week, it's not that God told them not to worship in that way, but God told them how to worship and they offered something that God had not authorized. In other words, they did not have God's permission to do what they did. And of course, they paid for that disobedience with their lives. And of course, right after that, uh, God gave a warning that the priests were not to be drinking alcohol on duty. And there seems to be some connection, perhaps, with uh, drinking and what they did that day. Well, today we move into a section of Leviticus where God explains the difference between what is clean and what is not clean. And this will be very important for God's people moving forward. And one of the biggest questions we have in this section in verses, or rather in chapters 11 through 15, is why? Why are certain foods and certain practices clean while others are not clean? And it doesn't always make sense to us. So what is the reason behind these rules? And as I kind of dug into this again, I found quite a bit of debate over this, as well as some pretty strange kind of far out theories concerning why things were clean or unclean. Uh, for example, some have suggested that the rules we are about to consider are merely symbolic. In other words, the people were allowed to eat animals that chew the cud because God wants us to chew on his word. 
or God wanted his people to eat animals with split hooves, uh, just like we should be split or separate from the world and so on. And people were really reading a lot of stuff into this that I, I, don't, I don't know about you, uh, but I'm not biting on that one. I, that just does not seem like a really honest way of dealing with scripture here because uh, the Bible doesn't describe it in that way. Uh, others have suggested that the restrictions are tied to animals that are abnormal in some ways. And this was a kind of a unique one I hadn't thought about for many years, but uh, some people are kind of speculating that kind of God wanted his people to avoid animals that were strange and didn't really fit the pattern uh, of the category that they belong to. For example, catfish or fish, they have fins, but they don't have scales, therefore they're weird and they need to be avoided. And that's kind of the, the reasoning there. So, so also camels, they chew the cud, but they have toes. And that's weird, so don't eat camels. And, uh, you know, likewise, pigs have cloven hooves, but they don't chew the cud, and so they're weird, and you need to avoid them for that reason. And I'm not really sure what the point of this would be, but uh, some have theorized that God is trying to tell his people to, uh, maybe to be normal, to kind of color within the lines, so to speak. And that really makes no sense to me ever, either. That kind of seems like a, a pretty big stretch to kind of base your whole argument on that. Um, others have suggested that the distinction between the clean and unclean may be tied exclusively to various health reasons. In other words, what is clean is safe to eat, and what is unclean is physically dangerous for some reason or another. Maybe even reasons we do not yet understand. For example, uh, concerning one we can understand, we can take pork as an example here. Probably eating pork is uh, the most famous of the food restrictions. Most people think about the Jewish people and what they cannot eat, and I think bacon is kind of at the top of that list. Well, of course, in the days before people had an understanding of microbiology and foodborne illnesses, before they had meat thermometers and proper sanitation, uh, God pretty much said, don't eat this, 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 and this, knowing that those particular foods are more dangerous to, than others. And I don't know about you, but to me, that seems to be a part of it. There seems to be something going on there. Uh, however, there are some problems with this theory. Uh, for one, there are also some foodborne illnesses related to cows and bulls and so on. And so why didn't God put cows on that list? So if he put pigs on there, why not pretty much every other animal? I mean, some animals are da more dangerous than others, but when you get right down to it, when you're eating an animal, there's going to be some uh, risk involved. The other problem with the health theory here is that the dietary restrictions were lifted by Jesus in uh, the book of Mark, looking back on that, Mark documents that. <clears throat> and so those food restrictions were lifted during the time of Christ when people still didn't understand microbiology. In other words, if health was the only thing going on here, all of us would really still be eating according to those dietary restrictions. So if pork is so dangerous, uh, then why did God tell Peter to arise and kill and eat before heading over to preach to Cornelius? In fact, uh, pork being dangerous, if that was the sole reason for the law, um, it, uh, there are some dots that aren't quite connected. Um, the other issue is that even from a health and food safety point of view, some of those restrictions still make no sense. In other words, there are still some things on this list that really are not unhealthy or inherently dangerous as far as we can tell. I mean, of course, there's always the possibility that we still don't know why some of those things are dangerous. Um, but nevertheless, what I've just said about the health aspects of the dietary restrictions, I think would also be true of some of the other laws that are still to come in this book. So I think health has something to do with it, but I don't think uh, health is the complete picture here. But there is another possibility here, and that is God is teaching his people the value of obedience. And I think in a sense, um, you know, these rules are something of a test. And I want us to start with our first passage tonight, actually skipping forward to the end of Leviticus chapter 11. So if you could kind of fast forward to Leviticus 11, uh, 44 through 47. And notice in Leviticus 11, 44 through 47, God gives the reason for some of these dietary restrictions. And this is what he said after going through this huge list of what you can and can't eat. For I am the Lord your God, 
Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. This is the law regarding the animal and the bird and every living thing that moves in the waters and everything that swarms on the earth to make a distinction between the clean or the unclean and the clean and between the edible creature and the creature which is not to be eaten. As I understand that this passage is basically God's way of saying, because I said so. And I think that's kind of why I'm, I'm leaning towards some combination of options three and four on your screen here. Uh, the dietary laws do seem to have some health reasons, but then there also seems to be a test of obedience in some of these. Sometimes we obey God even when we do not completely understand the reason for the command. And so the lesson is, if God tells us to do something, let's do it. And even back then, even though they might not, uh, might not have understood the danger of undercooked pork, uh, it was in their best interest to obey God by staying away from it, simply because God said so, even though they would never understand if God had tried to explain trichinosis to them. They didn't have microscopes and so on. Um, and by the way, when we think about it, what was the very first food restriction in world history? What was the first thing that people were told not to eat? Way back in Genesis chapter 2, God told Adam and Eve, Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so I think that kind of cinches it for me, at least kind of leaning toward number four here with number three as a consideration. In some ways, food can be a real test of our obedience. We eat to live. We've got to have food. So it's something most of us do several times a day. We're in different circumstances. We're with our families. We're on our own. We're traveling. We're at home. Uh, we're at work. All of us eat. And sometimes eating can be a real test of faith. Um, on this issue of holiness, one benefit of the food loss is that we tend to fellowship with the people that we eat with. And so it's kind of tied to this obedience and the holiness thing. So having separate food laws would naturally separate God's people from the surrounding cultures. Um, if you think of the Egyptians not eating with the Hebrews, remember that? Um, well, the Hebrews would go on to kind of have a similar policy toward just about everybody else. If you can't eat pork and everybody around you in the world is eating pork, then you kind of need to keep your distance, especially at mealtime. Uh, remember Daniel and his three friends not eating the king's food when they were taken captive? And then we think about Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians 5 concerning those who continue in sin. We are not even to eat with such a one who does that. So I'm just saying eating often implies fellowship. <clears throat> and when we fellowship with somebody, we kind of have a way of being affected by their behavior. And, and that is certainly one benefit to holiness. Holiness means that the people keep themselves separate through these food laws. And so I hope that makes sense, kind of tied into the holiness and the, and the obedience aspect of this. As the Israelites traveled toward the promised land, they were going to run into all kinds of people. And if they had their own separate food laws, they kind of had to eat separately and stay separate from the world in that way. And that kind of protected them from some of the influence from the surrounding nation. So uh, it's kind of the way that I'm leaning on this, although God never really does give us a straight answer on exactly why some of these things are clean versus unclean. To kind of get a, a, a taste, pardon me there, a taste of some of the food restrictions, um, let's back up and let's take a look at Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. So going back to the beginning of this chapter, kind of started at the end and we're moving back to the beginning. But this is Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. Leviticus 11, 1 through 8. The Lord spoke again to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever divides a hoof, thus making split hoofs, and chews the cud among the animals, that you may eat. Nevertheless, you are not to eat of those among those which chew the cud, or among those which divide the hoof, the camel. For though it chews cud, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. Likewise, the shafan, for though it chews cud, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. 
The rabbit also, for though it chews cud, it does not divide the hoof, it is unclean to you. And the pig, for though it divides the hoof, thus making a split hoof, it does not chew cud, it is unclean to you. You shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. Well, we're not going to go back through all the little details here, but starting here in Leviticus 11, God is giving the basic guidelines. And then not only does he give the rule, but he also gives several examples. And again, we're not going to get bogged down in the details. Uh, but again, pigs are the most obvious or most famous example of an unclean food in this passage. Under the law of Moses... God's people, the Jewish people, were forbidden from eating pork. No pork chops, no pulled pork barbecue, no bacon, and no jello, by the way, since I believe most uh, gelatin is a pork byproduct. There's a whole lot about food I really don't want to know, um, but there is pig in, in gelatin. Um, under the New Covenant, these restrictions, however, have been lifted completely. In Mark 7, 19, I alluded to that earlier, Jesus declared all foods to be clean. And that's where he said it's not what comes into the body, it's what's in your heart and leaves the body that really makes a person unclean. And looking back on it, Mark said, by saying that, Jesus declared all foods to be clean. But of course, many Jews, many Muslims uh, still live by some of these restrictions. And there are some within the so-called Christian community at large who also try to continue living by some of these restrictions as well. And, you know, if you don't want to eat pork, good for you, that's fine. And I'm not going to make fun of you, uh, maybe a little bit, uh, but not a whole lot. But I'm not going to harass you spiritually and, and make you feel like you're less of a Christian for doing that. The problem would be uh, for those who do eat by these restrictions to try to bind that on other people and say, well, you can't eat pork either. And there are some religious groups who will do that. Um, who, who will restrict the uh, kind of food that, that people eat. Um, anyway, something that uh, we need to keep in mind there. Um, but the, the restrictions, everything we're studying tonight, those restrictions on the food, all of that has been kind of repealed, we might say. Jesus said, um, you know, all foods are now clean. Um, in the rest of Leviticus chapter 11, continuing on after verse 8, God is going to go on to give similar rules for fish. In verses 9 through 12, birds in verses 13 through 19, insects in verses 20 through 23, swarming things, kind of a huge broad term including uh, stuff like crocodiles and lizards and critters with many feet. Have you ever eaten anything with many feet? Um, I have not, up to this point, that I know of, eaten anything with many feet, but uh, those are addressed in those later verses, verses 24 through 38. Um, interspersed throughout this passage would be some restrictions regarding what to do if one of these unclean animals dies and falls on you, or you touch it inadvertently, or it falls onto your stuff. And so if you wake up to a dead mouse in your coffee mug, for example, you, would I think, need to smash that mug and toss it under the law of Moses. Uh, probably a good move. I think some of you may do that on your own, even not even knowing that that was uh, in the Bible back in those times. Uh, but again, they didn't have dishwashers with the uh, Santa cycle on them and bleach and, and uh, the hot water and all that that we have today. So God had to explain some of this to them in terms of food safety. Well, this pretty much summarizes the food laws. So um, I want us to move on rather quickly through the next few chapters. We're kind of getting to chapter 16 next week, Lord willing. And, um, and so let's just hit some of the highlights tonight by kind of skipping through the next several chapters. Leviticus chapter 12 is a very short chapter giving some guidelines for childbirth. Um, the first paragraph mentions circumcision on the eighth day. I believe somebody mentioned that. I feel like it might have been Caleb. I'm not 100%, but in a class or a sermon here at Four Lakes a, a few months ago. So I want us, we've covered that. I want us to skip ahead to the end of this chapter. We've got kind of this seemingly insignificant little detail that it's going to pop up in the New Testament. So notice Leviticus 12. We're going to skip down to verses 6 through 8. Leviticus 12, 6 through 8. When the days of her purification are completed for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, whether a male or a female. But if she cannot afford a lamb, 
Then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she will be clean. So notice, once a child is born, the woman is to bring a lamb and a pigeon or turtle dove to the priest for an offering. But what I want us to notice here is that if she cannot afford a lamb, the woman is allowed to only offer the birds. So once again, as we learned a couple weeks ago, God is mindful of the poor. If you can't afford a lamb, it's not uh, too bad, so sad, you're out of luck, you're just going to, you know, be separated from God for the rest of your life. That's not the way God deals with the poor. But he inserts this clause in the law, allowing a lesser or a cheaper, so to speak, sacrifice for those who cannot afford the sacrifice that is required. So God allows this. You still got to offer something, but it's going to cost you less than it would if you had a regular income. So why is this significant? Well, we don't hear much about this in the Bible until we come all the way to Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, where Mary comes to the temple not with a lamb, but she comes with the birds, indicating that Mary was poor. Mary and Joseph were poor. So this was the Old Testament equivalent of being on food stamps, as we used to say, or the Old Testament equivalent of being on the free and reduced lunch program, if you want to put it in that way. If you have ever been poor, if you have been in that situation, I just want us to realize from this passage that Jesus understands. He grew up in a poor family, and I believe this is in the Bible for a reason. Jesus was born in this earth, not into a palace, not even into a regular middle-class family, but Jesus was born into poverty, even to the extent that his mom had to take the poor option when it came to making a sacrifice after his birth. Isn't that interesting? Here we are in the middle of Leviticus, and who would have thought that something, some little clause in the law uh, would have reminded us of the Lord? But uh, this is, in fact, carried over, and we read about this uh, when it comes to Mary under the New Covenant, and it tells us something about the Lord. He can empathize with us. All right, in the next section, in verses or chapters 13 and uh, uh, 14, God gives some instructions concerning various skin diseases. And again, we're not going to spend the next few weeks studying rashes <laughs> and leprosy. Uh, we're not uh, getting bogged down in that. It, it's important. It's scripture. But we're going to summarize and read some verses here and there. I want to kind of give a brief overview. And I think we can do this by noting the first six verses of chapter 13, as well as verses 45 through 52. So let's take a look at Leviticus 13, 1 through 6, and then we'll skip down to Leviticus 13, verses 45 through 52. Leviticus 13, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man has on the skin of his body a swelling, or a scab, or a bright spot, and it becomes an infection of leprosy on the skin of his body, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest, or to one of his sons the priest. The priest shall look at the mark on the skin skin of the body, and if the hair in the infection has turned white, and the infection appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is an infection of leprosy. When the priest has looked at him, he shall pronounce him unclean. But if the bright spot is white on the skin of his body, and it does not appear to be deeper than the skin, and the hair on it has not turned white, then the priest shall isolate him who, is, who has the infection for seven days. The priest shall look at him on the seventh day, and if in his eyes the infection is not changed and the infection is not spread on the skin, then the priest shall isolate him for seven more days. The priest shall look at him again on the seventh day, and if the infection has faded and the mark has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. So this is the first section, kind of giving us some of those details. But let's skip down now to verses 45 through 52. Let's get the other big part of this. Leviticus 13, 45 through 52. As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. 
when a garment has a mark of leprosy in it, whether it is a wool garment or a linen garment, whether in warp or woof, of linen or of wool, whether in leather or in any article made of leather, if the mark is greenish or reddish in the garment or in the leather or in the warp or in the woof or in any article of leather, it is a leprous mark and shall be shown to the priest. Then the priest shall look at the mark and shall quarantine the article with the mark for seven days. He shall then look at the mark on the seventh day. If the mark has spread in the garment, whether in the warp or in the wolf or in the leather, whatever the purpose for which the leather is used, the mark is a leprous malignancy, it is unclean. So he shall burn the garment, whether the warp or the wolf, in wool or in linen, or any article of leather in which the mark occurs. For it is a leprous malignancy, it shall be burned in the fire. Well, um, we're not going to go through every verse here, but just in these few verses that we ha we've got some public health guidelines. I think I'll just summarize it in that way. It's more than guidelines, it's God's law, but I think today we would, we would view this as uh, guidance for public health. And this would have been absolutely revolutionary back in those days. I mean, first of all, we've got an emphasis on the proper diagnosis of the disease. Did you catch that? Back up in verses 2 and 3, the priests are given some information concerning what to look for, concerning how to diagnose these skin diseases. And the priests, as those who have now been educated in this, they've now been told what to look for, they know what this looks like, they are now given the authority to decide what this thing is. And so if you're walking around one day and you look down and you've got some kind of rash or a spot on your skin, you got to go show yourself to the priest so he can figure it out. And the priest has been educated. He can decide, is this serious? Is it not? Today, we would go to a dermatologist. I go to a dermatologist now every year. Uh, he says, I've been diagnosed with an advanced case of wisdom that I inherited from my father. So, so far, nothing to be worried about, but he's keeping an eye on some stuff, and uh, we're thankful for good doctors today. But back then, it was the priest that God informed, and so they were the ones who would have to do these kind of skin inspections. And just thinking back to the pandemic we've just been through, wasn't this really the huge first step? When people started getting sick back in the fall of 2019 into the winter of 2020, the first big challenge was figuring out what in the world is this thing? People are having cold-like symptoms. People got some dying going on here and there. So what's going on? What are we dealing with? So we had to identify the disease, then you had to diagnose it properly, and that's why testing was so huge back then at the beginning. You know, we thought at first it was spread through touch, and so we had an, we had an emphasis on sanitizing surfaces, but then we went on to learn that it was spread, no, not through touch, primarily through the air. And so that changed our approach. And so the point is, stopping a disease has to start with a proper diagnosis. What are we dealing with here? And so um, we see this with the various skin diseases in Leviticus. You don't want this thing spreading through a camp of two to three million people. I remember we had a Bible camp years back, uh, kind of during the bird flu scare. And I don't remember what year that was. Um, but I remember just being concerned about that because we were just in the beginning days of that kind of scare. and We didn't really know a lot of hand washing. Remember, wash your hands before meals and all that. So you got to know what you're dealing with, proper diagnosis. So that's the first big principle here. Secondly, in verse 4, we also have the concept of quarantine, don't we? Isolation. So if the spot on this guy's skin looks serious, well, the priests are to inspect that, and they are to make the decision that this guy's got to stay away from everybody for a while. In this case, to be reevaluated in a week, and then if it's truly a disease that may spread, the guy in verse 45 is to tear his clothing. He is to make it obvious that something's wrong. He's to uncover his head. And so if most people wore turbans or hats in those days, if you saw a guy without a hat, that was a signal, stay away. And uh, a lot of times people today think it's disrespectful to wear a hat. Back then, apparently, if you didn't wear a hat, they thought you had leprosy. So keep that in mind. I like wearing a hat. Um, so anyway, he is to tear his clothing, uncover his head. He is to cover his mustache. And he is to cry out, calling out loudly, unclean, unclean. And so he is to make himself look contagious, first of all. So he is to announce his condition. Stay away from me. I have this thing, and you don't want it. But also notice, he is to cover his mustache. What in the world is that about? 
as I understand it, he is not supposed to be breathing on people. At least that's the way I think I would take this. And, uh, you know, today we'd say, we talk about masks, wouldn't we? And I thought about that during the pandemic. It kind of goes back to that cover your mustache kind of thing when you have this illness. So um, he's not supposed to be breathing on people and spreading whatever he has. Um, in kindergarten, our kids learned one of the most important lessons they've ever learned in school from Ms. Padley. When you cough or sneeze, do it in your elbow pit. Do not sneeze on your hands because you touch stuff with your hands. That's an awesome lesson in kindergarten. Everybody needs to learn that. A lot of adults need to remember that. Um, had a lot of politicians during the uh, pandemic talk about, you know, don't be doing this or this. And then they'd cough in their hand and shake people's hands on their way out off the stage. Um, anyway, um, our kids had an awesome kindergarten teacher. But I think we clearly see the concept of quarantine in these two chapters. If you've been diagnosed with some terrible disease, stay away from other people. Um, stop the spread. All right. Finally, as summarized down in verse 52. We have some instruction for how to decontaminate or destroy uh, everything the person who is sick might have touched. Uh, and we see this several times in this section. Certain things had to be destroyed. Other things could be washed. And we do the same thing today, don't we? You know, not because God said so in the book of Leviticus, but today we understand how diseases are spread. And so between... Uh, people passing through a hospital room, you know, you got one patient, that patient gets better and moves, you wipe everything down. If the patient dies, you know, and a new patient comes in, obviously everything, I mean, everything's clean, everything's wiped down, everything's sanitized. So some sanit sanitization going on here. Um, but what we learn from this section as a whole is that God loves his people. He wants them to be safe. They're heading out into the wilderness, two to three million people, you know, no running water, soap, hot water, you know, uh, alcohol wipes, none of that. And he wants to preserve them through the year so that Jesus can ultimately be born through this group. So that's where this is all headed. Um, by the way, God made an interesting promise back in Exodus 15:26. As they were leaving Egypt, God said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your God. I am your healer. So God then had promised to keep his people safe if they would only listen. And this is certainly a part of it. Uh, before we close tonight, I want to just uh, briefly um, summarize Leviticus chapter 15. This chapter describes the discharge of various bodily fluids. We'll put it that way. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on in this chapter. And from a public health point of view, God describes what needs to happen in each situation. And if I could summarize, God wants his people to be clean. Wash yourselves, take a bath, clean up whatever you were sitting on. If somebody spits on you, clean that up as well. Uh, stay away from people for a while, depending on whatever it is. And as you may be able to see on your screen, verse 31 seems to be a pretty good summary of really all of chapter 15. But in the middle of explaining how to deal with all of this, God says, Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, so that they will not die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is among them. So the way I see it, God wants his people to be clean. So his message is, I'm going to live with you, but you guys better wash yourselves up. And, uh, you know, when something happens down there, you need to keep clean. And... Uh, you know, if you have a chance, I would encourage you to uh, read through this chapter and the others in their entirety tonight. We really didn't read every verse by any means, but we just went through this kind of hitting the highlights. So uh, sorry about the PowerPoint slide there, uh, thing going on there a while ago. Kind of got ahead of myself, tried to get back, and I went back somewhere. So anyway, this brings us to the end of our third lesson from the book of Leviticus. We've studied the first 15 chapters. We're moving through the book rather quickly, I'd say very quickly, and next week we hope to look at the Day of Atonement, and I think that's in Leviticus uh, 17, um, but uh, maybe 16, I don't have my notes right here, but the next chapter here is in always. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. If there's something we need to be praying about, let us know. If there's something we can do to encourage you, give a call, send a text, 608-224-0274. And as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer.
Our Father in heaven, you are a great and awesome God. You are the God who rescued your people from the land of Egypt and you brought them safely into the promised land. Along the way, you gave them instruction concerning how to be holy, how to be different, set apart from the world around them. Thank you for preserving your people so that we can have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus. Through Jesus, when he came to this earth, you demonstrated your perfect power over all diseases. You healed the leper. You restored sight to the blind and hearing to those who were deaf. You made the lame walk again and even raised the dead. Thank you, Father, for loving us. We love you and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.